and hope that you, as a newbie parachuter, can float your <laughs> right. way into this Yeah, boat. I don't have any record of him being an amateur yeah. parachutist. So my money's on that it was a conspiracy that they killed him. Whether or not it was the door got thrown off and reached someone reached out from the inside and pulled it up, whatever. Yeah. Whatever the details are, because it's such an old fucking story chance, <laughs> there's no forensics or any real details to it. So we'll never really know, will we? No, no, we won't. And isn't that the fun part about stories from the early 1900s? I think they're fun. Yeah. All right, so my topics are a little different. It's a list. It's a list episode. Okay. I but like it, list episodes. But it's only three stories. I decided to cover three true stories that have a major plot twist. Okay. Again, it's one of those things where I find a story that I really, really like, but there's not enough details to make it long enough to do a whole episode on it. Right. So then I just compile them and try to find like a... A thread that makes them all similar. Uh -huh. And then that's how I named the episode. <laughs> all right. The first one is The Death of Agneta Westland. All right. I hope I'm saying her name right. My sources are The Claremont Sun, BBC News, and Cracked.com. One evening in September of 2008, 65-year-old Agneta took her dog for a walk near Loftehammer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a small town in Sweden near the Baltic Sea. All right. When it got dark and she didn't come back in like her normal amount of time, her husband got worried and decided to follow her usual walking trail, which was along a lake by okay. their home. A scenic route. Yes. And as he's walking along this trail, he finds his wife, Agneta, beaten to death on the ground. Oh. He calls 911, and as soon as officers arrive, he is arrested at the scene for murder. Just like that? Just like that. I don't know how Swedish police do it, but they aren't fucking around, apparently. Okay. In one of the articles, I read that there was really nobody for miles and miles and miles, so they just quickly assumed that it was him. Had to have been him. Right. His name was Ingmar. And again, <laughs> okay. I know I'm not saying it right. I-N-G-E-M-A-R. Someone knows how to pronounce it. It ain't me. <laughs> but his name was Ingmar. He's professing his innocence. He's explaining she went on a walk with the dog. I just found her. And they're like, fuck you, go to jail. He sits in jail for 10 days while Swedish police conduct this whole investigation. And ultimately, he's released after 10 days for lack of evidence. But it doesn't matter because the damage has been done. The entire small town of Lofthammer uh -huh. hates him. Yeah, sure. He killed his wife. He's a fucking son of a bitch. He's got to go. Trial by public. Even his friends and family shun him. Mm. He ends up having to move because the constant harassment of people throwing shit at his house and whatnot. Wow. So the investigation found that Agneta had basically been bludgeoned to death. They also found some injuries that were consistent with being crushed to death. Like mm. maybe someone threw something heavy on top of her. Mm. They also found debris on her clothing and some sort of liquid. And they initially assumed that... What they found was dog hair and maybe dog slobber because, like I said, she was walking her dog. Yeah. But they sent it off to go get a DNA analysis. Six months later, because you know DNA. Six months? DNA takes a long time. It comes back and the police were able to determine Agneta's killer. Agneta had been beaten and crushed to death by a European elk. Oh, no. Or a moose. North America, we say moose. But I guess in Europe, they call them European elks. Mooses. Mises. The elk in Sweden are anywhere between 8 to 10 feet tall, <laughs> and they weigh around 1,000 pounds, and some are as heavy as 1,500 pounds. That's a big animal. It's a big motherfucker. And they're not normally aggressive. In fact, they're known to be super shy animals, and they will run from just about anything. They say that even small animals like squirrel and rabbits will make them jump and run away. Wow. <laughs> The only time they really get aggressive is if it's a mother with her young. Oh, yeah. Well, there was a local gang of elk. And yes, they are a gang. I looked it up. That's what they're called? Yes. A <laughs> gang of elk that were notorious in the area for eating fallen apples that had started fermenting. Oh, no. <laughs> and this gang of elk would get sloppy drunk. And when they got drunk, they got aggressive. Mm. 
Several years before that, this gang of elk surrounded a senior citizen home and would charge at anybody trying to come in or out of it. They ended up having to call authorities, and even with their lights and sirens, they had a hard time chasing them away because the elk were charging the vehicles. That's crazy. So obviously the way they found out was the debris on Agnetta's clothes was elk fur. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. And the liquid was saliva from an elk. And what they theorize is that she must have come across a drunk elk because mm-hmm. there were fermented apples on the ground there. And her dog may have, it. Yeah, may have started barking and it became aggressive and attacked her. And not to get too graphic, but they think how she sustained her injuries more specifically was it kicked her to death once she was on the ground. Because I guess that's how they fight. They don't really use their antlers as much. Okay. They kick. And what's crazy about this entire story is this happened in 2008. Can you imagine that this happened in 98 or 88? Her husband would have sat in jail forever. Yeah. Forever. Uh Uh-huh. If there was no DNA, they would have never known that it was an elk that killed her. Yeah, they would assume, like you said, dog hair. Mm Mm-hmm. So he ended up suing the police department for the 10 days and all the damage done by the public just assuming that he was the killer. Yeah. And I couldn't find if he was compensated in any way, which usually means they settle out of court. But I decided today, and hopefully moving forward if I can, that I'm going to try to end my stories with some sort of knowledge. Oh, okay. Okay. Not in any way to, like, victim shame anybody, because I would never want to do that, but I have no fucking idea what to do if you encounter a moose, an elk in the wild. Yeah. What would you do? I would get real big. Yeah, we just watched that stupid, there's a show on Netflix, what is it called, the bullshit game show? Uh Uh-huh. It just came out, and we were watching it last night, and one of the questions is, like, what do you do if you see a bear? Uh Uh-huh, yeah. Yeah. And you and I both thought it was wave your arms and stand tall, get really big. No, that's Mormons. Stand tall. Remember who you are. (laughs) (laughs) But get real big. Make a lot of noise. And the answer was like, you stay quiet and back off slowly. And we were like, well, we're fucked. If a bear tries to get us. So. A fist fight a bear. (laughs) According to stacker.com, if you come across an elk, stay in a group. If you're in a group. And do not make eye contact. Okay. And you also back away slowly. If one charges at you, get behind something big like a car or a boulder, or you can climb a tree. They may hit the tree a couple of times, but eventually they will lose interest. Because like I said, most of them are only aggressive if they have a a child. Nope. What's a baby moose? Mises. No, it's a... You know? Colt. That's a horse. (laughs) Do you know? (laughs) A foal. No, okay. A baby moose. That's the only reason why they're going to get mad at you is because they think you're near their baby moose. So, a calf, maybe. A calf, yes. It is a calf. Okay. So, climb a tree and they'll be done with you. Unless it's drunk and then I don't know. Until he sobers up. You could try. That's a lot lot of body weight on that thing. Just run around a tree in a circle. How many fermented apples does it take to get a thousand pounds something drunk that's a shit ton of apples <laughs> they have no self-control Uh uh-uh. <laughs> they have no tolerance at all yeah all right so my next story is the incredible story of frida sophia frida does, sophia does this ring any bells for you no she got two first names though yes she does My sources on this one were the New York Times, The Guardian, and BBC News. This one happens on September 19th, 2017. Mexico City suffers an earthquake with a magnitude of 7.1, which is pretty high, because I think the highest one ever recorded is 9.3. Whoa. The earthquake collapsed over 40 buildings, injured around 6,000 people, and killed over 315 people. One of the reasons why it was so deadly is that it happened on the 32nd anniversary of the 1985 Mexico City earthquake that killed around 10,000 people. And they would yearly honor those people by ringing the earthquake alarm system at 11 a.m. Oh. On that day. Uh Uh-huh. So just like every year, they rang it at 11 a.m. to honor the 1985 victims. 
Then two hours later, they rang it a second time. Uh Uh-huh. But it was only 20 seconds before the 7.1 earthquake hit. Oh. So not only did people not have enough time to get out of buildings, but they also just assumed maybe it was a mess up. Yeah. Or they were ringing it twice in honor. Yeah, they wouldn't assume, surely, another earthquake. One of the buildings that collapsed was a church holding mass, which killed 15 people and trapped many more. Another church also collapsed during a baptism and killed 11 people, including the baby being baptized. Several of the other buildings halfway collapsed, but caught fire, trapping the people inside them. Mm. Some of the buildings that stood ended up exploding from gas leaks. Oh, shit. So they make it through the earthquake. Right. But then blow up. Other buildings were evacuated, and the city and surrounding areas were put into a state of emergency, and the military was deployed to search in the rubble for any survivors. Among the buildings that collapsed was a primary school named the Enrique Rabsamen School. Okay. I know I didn't say that right, but we're just going to roll with it. The school was really small, and normally it would not have collapsed. However, there was... A 20-ton apartment building that was built on top of it illegally. Oh. So when the earthquake hit, it collapsed underneath the weight of the apartments. Obviously, search efforts focused heavily on the school. They were told that there was about 30 children in there and about 15, 10 to 15 adults. And after digging in the rubble for over 24 hours, everyone's hope is starting to fade. Damn. They found a lot of bodies. Um, they're using thermal scanners and... They end up picking up something that looks like it could be a child. Okay. And a thermal scanner is good because it means that there's heat still in the body. Right. Where it pulls up is in the basement area, which is just out of reach. And they're afraid to dig into that area for fear that the pocket that the child is in is going to collapse. Yeah. Killing it. So they're trying to find little ways into there. Now, I just want to point out that this is not necessarily just military personnel. Or first responders. These are everyday people digging. Because, like I said, there's over 40 collapsed buildings in this city. So it's all hands on deck. Everybody is trying to dig in every place they can to look for anybody that survived. So not everybody was on the same team here, like thinking-wise. Right. And not everybody was knowledgeable in how to handle this. They were just doing the best they could. Well, the report spread throughout Mexico of this child who had survived that was stuck in this basement. And it becomes like a, do you remember baby Jessica in the well uh-huh. here? It becomes yep. one of those situations. Yeah. Everybody is glued to their TV screen and they cannot wait to hear an update about this kid yeah. and how they're going to get this kid out. So as the days go on, news outlets would post up outside the recovery area, just trying to get interviews with anybody coming in or out. And little by little, they're starting to get more and more pieces of information. They learned that it was a female, that she was 12 years old, and that her name was Frida Sophia. Okay. They had people coming out that were sobbing, saying that they touched the little girl's hand, that they were able to take her vitals. Other people were saying that they had passed her water, that she's speaking in a whisper, but she's basically unharmed. Yeah, so good news. And this is a huge fucking deal. Like... Every single news outlet is clamoring to get interviews with these people. They want every single bit of information they can about this little girl. Because after this huge devastation, this is a glimmer of hope that everyone can hold on to. And everyone is eating it up. People are holding vigils for her. There are signs like actual billboards saying, like, we're here for you, Frida Sophia. Everyone's trying to contact her parents. But the thing is, is that Frida Sophia did not exist. Really? Did not exist. There was no child down there. Oh. Well, after a week or so into this search, a spokesperson from the Mexico Navy came forward and said that there was no little girl in the rubble. That there never was a little girl in the rubble. He went on to explain that 11 children were rescued alive the very first day and subsequently bodies of 19 children and 6 adults were recovered and that there was only one person in the school that was unaccounted for and it was a 58-year-old woman that had worked there. And they believed that she was deceased. Uh They just couldn't find her yet. Yeah. 
In fact, there wasn't anybody on school records even named Frida Sophia. The hell? And after his statement, they ended 